Now, rate setting season is still underway. Kenya's Monetary Policy Committee took the cautious route on November 28th, leaving the policy rate unchanged at 10%. Now, the committee argued that private sector credit growth had stabilized at 4.6% year on year in October. Now, despite that being well under historical levels of well over 15% uh, growth year on year, the committee is of the view that this slowdown is likely due to what it described as structural factors and is not a direct result of its own monetary policy actions. As far as the central bank is concerned, the slowdown in lending has no negative impact on economic growth. Several economists, however, disagree. Earlier on, I spoke to Stanbeck's economist in charge of East Africa, Gibran Qureshi. Private sector credit growth was already um, subsiding even before the cap came into effect. Yeah. Which is, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board and, and ask ourselves why was it declining? And Typically, according to our research, there's always a six-month lag between higher interest rates and a slowdown in private sector credit growth, which subsequently gives rise to um, higher NPLs. Mm -hmm. But I think this cycle was unique in the sense that we saw three commercial banks go under receivership. And what this actually brought about was um, a rise in risk aversion from the larger banks toward the smaller banks, mm -hmm. closing interbank um, credit lines, um, generally smearing them with negativity and not allowing them um, you know, any sort of liquidity. So if the smaller banks, to a large extent, don't have the liquidity, they can't extend that credit. So that's where we are, unfortunately. But I think the fact that we've got an interest rate control could exacerbate this whole problem. The domino effect here does seem to be pretty scary because if you have a slowdown in private sector growth, that essentially implies you have less investment, less consumption. And if you have both of those things reducing, therefore the growth that we're talking about of near 6% is pretty much off the table, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. I think you're, you're spot on there. So uh, when we look at uh, the interest rate control, um, we like to draw lessons upon what happened in Zambia. Mm -hmm. So Zambia obviously experimented with the interest rate caps um, between 2013 and abandoned it in 2015. Yeah. But Zambia's GDP wasn't that affected because private sector credit as a percentage of GDP in Zambia is 24%. Mm. Uh, credit as a percentage of GDP in Kenya is near 50%. So the forward linkages a slowdown in private sector credit growth could have on overall GDP could be more profound in Kenya. Mm. So I think 6% is certainly off the table. Um, the epicenter will be in 2017. Um, you know, we're expecting a print of about 5.5%. We've revised that lower from 6%. But again, I think we need to think about whether public investment in infrastructure is really going to be that impacted by a slowdown in credit growth. So probably not. Right. Um, Barclays earlier today essentially forecasting they expect the Kenyan shilling to fall to around 106, 107 against the dollar um, sometime next year. Do you agree? Uh, we're broadly in line uh, with a similar forecast. I think our, our view is 10650 by the end of 2017. Um, not only because it's an election year and we could potentially see portfolio investors exiting. Uh, what we need to be cognizant of here, Rama, is that uh, Egypt has just moved to a flexible exchange regime. Uh -huh. The Egyptian market is a more, uh, you know, it's a bigger market. It's a, it's a more liquid market. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm already seeing a lot of investors um, reallocate uh, their funds towards uh, Egyptian equities and bonds. Uh, explain how that works uh, for the benefit of our viewers, because normally we talk to guys in your business and we talk about this sort of, um, at least in the past, it used to be this sort of parallel link, this vacuum effect mm -hmm. between Nigeria and Kenya. So money would move from Nigeria, jump into Kenyan equities and vice versa. But now there's Egyptians coming to the equation with this um, new regime with the floating of the Egyptian pound. So we're essentially entering a sort of triangular trade here. Sure. I think you're right. So with the exception of South Africa, so South Africa is seen as, you know, the benchmark of liquidity in emerging markets, but it is the most uh, liquid market in Africa. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after that, uh, I think Egypt falls second and then Nigeria. Yeah. But of course, Nigeria hasn't completely uh, liberalized exchange rate, yeah, if I may still put have it that way. Controls and right. That. I think it's uh, you know typically just um, you know the same problems that we had. The backlogs of FX are, are becoming even worse. But Egypt has uh, committed themselves to an IMF program. The reforms uh, and the preconditions in that in those ref in, in that in that program uh, you know compel them to uh, adopt a, a floating exchange rate. Mm -hmm. I think markets generally um, embrace that. Markets really. Uh, pleased with that kind of movement. So um, we're, we're seeing that, you know, triangular shift, as you said. And um, unfortunately, at this point in time, with uh, the equity market in Kenya underperforming, uh, I believe the infrastructure bonds are perhaps, you know, near lows. 
uh, it's unlikely that we're going to see a lot of portfolio investors come into Kenya in 2017, more specifically as it's an election year. Yeah. So the anxiety that's associated with that event in August uh, you know, really concerns investors.